Sir Isaac Newton, 1642 to 1727, president of the Royal Society, is probably best known as the author of Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, a compendium of experimentally replicable physical observations outlined and graphed according to mathematical principles. This work lays out Newton's three main tenets regarding motion. 1. Regarding inertia, an object, stationary or in motion, will remain in the same phase, stationary or in motion, unless or until acted upon by another force or object. 2. Regarding entropy, the multiplication of mass by acceleration equals the force of an object. 3. Regarding momentum, every object has an equal and opposite force, and for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Between the Principia's publication in 1687 and Einstein's Annus Mirabilis in 1905, these three principles were seen as the chief, utmost, and primary laws of physics governing the entirety of the visible cosmos. If any event could occur in the physical cosmos, it could be predicted exactly according to Newtonian models. At least so was believed until Einstein challenged the Newtonian concept of gravity being solely a centripetal force and asserted that a nearby object's gravity could warp the light emitted from a more distant object like a lens, creating an effect of stellar parallax. For the first two-thirds of its existence, the modern philosophical school of physics was Newtonian, and as such it was premised on the scientific method of hypothesis, experiment, and result, on the principle of Occam's razor, stating that if all other explanations prove false, a counterintuitive option may yet prove true, and on the principles of deductive logical reasoning in general. As a result of this, a great deal of credence is given in the modern scientific community to demonstration by replicable experiment. Anything that can be illustrated by some physical feat can more easily then be used as an example for another, larger, or even invisible force's impact on cause and effect. Newtonian thinking is therefore limited by belief to a more or less linear model for cause and effect. One domino or event impacts the next domino or event, and so on and so forth. However, without the kinetic exchange of forces between one object and another, cause and effect, should they occur, can only be inferred as resulting from the motion of smaller particulates in an otherwise invisible medium. However, this is not yet explained what distinguishes the quark gluon plasma from the supposedly empty Hilbert space between atoms, or from the relative ether energy of the microwave background radiation that fills the depths of outer space. Because only direct effects can be measured objectively in Newtonian models, indirect effects, so-called a-causal connecting principles, are more difficult to measure. Nevertheless, such apparently serendipitous coincidences continually occur in nature, and one can easily posit the anthropic argument that complex, multicellular living organisms could not have evolved from the primordial ooze without such an against-all-odds sort of occurrence. If Newtonian entropy is truly a universally applicable principle, then the earliest bonding of macromolecules into single cellular protozoa, amoeba-sized microbes inside the nuclei of which were the original coded strands of DNA, being a negentropic process itself, could never have occurred. Therefore, for life to have evolved, Newtonian entropy must not be absolutely ubiquitous universally. In some places, there will arise closed systems of negentropy from within the open system of entropy that encompasses and surrounds them. The standard model of essentially linear cause and effect based on Newtonian principles of physics depends on kinetic collisions for observations to be able to be made about otherwise invisible fields of force. 
Electrons orbiting atomic nuclei, for example, require collision with a photon in order to coalesce from a condition of uncertainty into a fixed electrical charge. Without such an example of transfer of force from one particle format of matter to another, it remains counterintuitive to the mind of a classically trained Newtonian physicist to think of an invisibly small particulate medium permeating all matter as being able to transmit spooky action at a distance or indirect interconnectivity between otherwise unrelated objects. However, apparently unrelated events occurring simultaneously to one another may share a common cause even if this cause remains shrouded from the naked eye. What we will be looking at in this presentation is how to physically, visibly, model the effect of an immaterial field of pure energy. Christian Huyens 1629 to 1695, a fellow of the Royal Society, is perhaps best known for his work on aurology, describing his invention of the pendulum clock. In this work, Huyen sets forth a premise based on his observation that two or more pendulum clocks hung on the same wall would eventually synchronize with one another's cyclical pendulum swings. Although this effect of purportedly isochronous, perfectly synchronous timing was challenged as being merely plesiochronous or not quite perfectly synchronized, its true cause was not known until Enrique M. Olivier and Louis V. Mello published their study in a 2015 issue of scientific reports demonstrating that interfaced sound waves Communicating between pendulum clocks through the medium of the wall caused them to approach rhythmic similitude. This Huyen synchronization effect can be demonstrated also using metronomes, set to tick out of sync with one another, however all placed onto the same surface, which surface is then given its own inertial reference point by being separated from touching the ground. Eventually, all the metronomes will tick in unison with one another. This is the result of the same Huyen's synchronization effect influencing the pendulum clocks, whereby sound waves from each ticking chronometer overlap with one another, creating an interfaced field of clicking noises until finally a rhythmic pattern begins to emerge from the more chaotic this effect results from two primary component factors. One, the disturbance by audible wavelengths to oxygen and hydrogen macromolecules in thin air. And two, a stable but independently weighted shared solid medium through which these sound waves may be communicated. The vertical wall on which the pendulum clocks were hung in Huyen's original model, served as this medium surface, but a horizontal platform suspended by strings so as not to touch the ground, or a flat platform with two cylinder wheels supporting it, can accomplish the same effect when modeling it using metronomes. The elasticity or plasticity of the shared surface's medium determines its permeability to transmitting the force of the sound waves, but the shared surface can also do much more than merely serve as a medium for the transmission of sound waves when seen as a symbolic model for a higher order phenomenon. In this case, this higher order phenomenon would encompass all occurrences of so-called synchronization. The desired goal, then, would be to construct on a microscale an experiment designed to test this higher order force that occurs on a macro scale. Although the original model, that of two or more pendulum clocks, easily replicated by metronomes, may appear to work as an example of this, Huyen's synchronization effect. Because it has as its explanation sound waves through a unifying medium, 
and because not all examples of synchronization occur as a result of these combined elements, the clock's model for synchronization effect works as a referential starting point, but can ultimately serve best as only a symbolic model for how the entire synchronization effect may be transmitted and occur. The clock's model, as stated, depends on sound waves and shared surface as medium. Therefore, when looking at other models in which apparent synchronization occurs, we should also be looking for distinguishing characteristic traits that could be comparable to these elements, the sound waves and the shared surface. The role of the shared surface in other such models is, as we shall see, that of a medium through which the synchronizing systems are broadcasting the signal by which they remain synchronized, whether in the form of sound waves or not. The function of the shared surface is for the sound waves like what the function of the air currents of wind are for the leaves on a tree. One invisible media transmits force, but it becomes visible through the motions of many independent objects operating in unison. If we consider two or more clocks synchronizing as an example of a naturally occurring phenomenon, this has much wider and further reaching implications than if we consider it as an isolated event with its own unique set of circumstantial explanations. Nevertheless, if sufficient examples of circumstantial evidence can be accumulated to demonstrate synchronization as a possible physical principle, then, even with a unique set of circumstantial explanations, the clocks experiment would still serve as a solid sounding board and square one from which to begin further research on this topic. It should be noted that a model may demonstrate synchronization even if we cannot find a correspondence in it to either the sound waves being transmitted nor the shared surface through which they are transmitted. However, it should also be noted that this shared surface or medium is merely a model for what can be thought of by logical utmost extension as akin to the space-time continuum, and these sound waves only a model for what can be seen as, likewise by being taken to their most likely extremity, gravity. In this experiment, we see that a tone produced by striking one tuning fork is able to be transmitted to another tuning fork held nearby. The fact the second tuning fork is able to sustain this tone's pitch even after the extinguishment first tuning fork's tone is, again, an example of Huyen's synchronization effect, because it results from the interfacing of sound waves. Thus, passing the torch has a parody and ringing a bell, both methods of long-distance communication in tribal and semi-sedentary cultures. From a 2012 article, entitled, Linking Synchronization to Self-Assembly, using magnetic Janus colloids, published in the periodical Nature. A team of material science, engineering, and physics professors from Northwestern and Illinois universities posit this video showing synchronization selected microtubes of Janus colloids, micron-sized spherical particles with different surface chemistry on their opposing hemispheres, which we study using imaging and computer simulation. A thin nickel film coats one hemisphere of each silica particle to generate a discoid magnetic symmetry, such that in a processing magnetic field, its dynamics retain crucial phase freedom. Synchronizing their motion, these Janus spheres self-organize into micrometer scale tubes in which the constituent particles rotate and oscillate continuously. In addition, the microtube must be tidally locked to the particles. That is, the particles must maintain their orientation within the rotating microtube. The last model demonstrating synchronization effect we will be examining in this section is a row of 15 pendulums, each of unique length string from one another. When these pendulums are withdrawn and then all let go at the same time, 
The result is, as shown from along the direction of their alignment, an interfacing of motions as each pendulum returns to its start position at its own unique rate. Ultimately, we must pose the question, is apparent synchronization due to a higher order phenomenon, or is it merely an optical illusion caused by a not yet known limitation to our awareness? If we are looking for synchronizations to occur in multiple different conditions, then we may be looking not for only one explanation unifying all the examples, but instead a series of proximally metastable layers shells or levels, wherein on each level are demonstrated harmonically comparable phenomena, even though these differing phenomena in themselves may each have their own explanations for causes and no other apparent connection to one another. If synchronization does occur as a natural principle, it may only appear to some extent here or to another extent there and yet still be related between these seemingly unconnected events, simply due to the nature of the phenomenon of synchronicity in the medium of 4D time. The first example we will examine here of synchronization effect in the animal kingdom is also the most common and easy to find, an ant hive. Ants and bees both form swarms, and both are insect monarchies, with all antennae plugged into one wavelength, the good of the queen of their colony. But ants exhibit another specific skill that bees seemingly lack, the ability to cooperate with one another so efficiently that they can form natural bridges and even natural rafts out of their own bodies in order to support on their backs the more important drone workers, the queen, and the larva. Using their exoskeletons for tensegrity, a colony of ants can natural raft upon the surface of the water in a flood, each ant locking legs with its neighbor and all holding on together to weather the storm. Each ant benefits from their cooperation with all the rest by surviving. For ants, with their hive mind, synchronization of efforts between individuals is not so impressive. Ants and bees, however, are not the only insects that form or travel in swarms. Certain aphids, locusts, and beetles appear only occasionally en masse and during these breeding seasons may invade a populated area posing a problem for the people and plants living there. Mayflies, for example, are small, mostly harmless pests that breed, as their name indicates, during the month of May. They can be seen swarming in a large, dark cloud. As they are all riding the same air current, all the bugs are carried about on its winds but they use their wings to stay in tandem with one another in order to maintain their formation as a swarm. Whether the mayflies are communicating with one another, as do ants and bees via their antenna, has not yet been thoroughly researched. However, the preponderance of pests traveling in swarms is a matter of no historical debate. Simply because one link on the food chain mimics a certain pattern, does not always mean other links in the food chain will as well, although in this case the swarming of pests could explain the swarming of larger brained species in the animal kingdom. Underwater, we find many schools of fish will form swarms, although apparently in a feeding frenzy, each fish is nevertheless, theoretically, as independent from all the rest during such mad rushes into cyclonic swarms as they are at any other time when not engaging in such a massive writhing throng. Here one must also pause to wonder to what extent the fish, swimming in a self-connecting cyclical pattern, are influencing the currents of the water they are swimming on themselves, creating a recursive feedback loop, multiplying the force exerted from the fish swimming by the momentum of the currents stirred up in the water from them doing so. In the skies, 
we find many flocks of birds that will form swarms under the proper conditions. These starlings, filmed near Netavot, occupied Palestine, are exhibiting an aspect of such swarming called murmuration. When all the starlings in the flock pivot, dive, and soar in sync to one another, and seem to all be moving as one. And so we see that bugs, fish, and birds all occasionally form swarms, and when they travel about in such a manner, they exhibit a form of synchronization effect. But herein lies the difference between apparently synchronized behaviors being exhibited by living systems and apparently synchronous events occurring concurrently between multiple inanimate objects. For living beasts, their swarming ends whenever they all choose it to, and each breaks off to their own separate way. But for inanimate objects in synchronized conditions, only by changing these conditions can the pattern be broken and the objects become asynchronous again. While we may be able to make a model using Janus colloids that demonstrates a hypothesis about synchronization's role in self-organization, we cannot posit with certainty that this is in any way similar to how atoms form covalent bonded molecules. Even though the model using Janus colloids may appear a convincing replica of how atoms bond to form molecules. It remains dependent on the parameters affecting its confined, closed system of space primarily, and only secondarily relates to anything else beyond this in nature. For example, in the clocks model for Huyen's synchronization effect, the metronomes, if removed from their shared surface, or if the shared surface is removed from its condition of independent mobility relative to the ground, will quickly fall out of phase with one another and revert to independent rhythms. Changing the parameters of the experiment only slightly terminates its effectiveness as a demonstration for the phenomenon of synchronization. Likewise in the experiment with the two tuning forks. If the pitch is altered in the second tuning fork by applying a weighted clamp, the tone from the first tuning fork will not be able to transfer into the second tuning fork. When two tuning forks with different pitch are played concurrently, their wavelengths still resonate with one another, but they do so in an alternating phase-shifting tempo, forming an isochronic tone between their combined wavelengths itself of the difference between these wavelengths. The last model we will examine here is, once again, the model of 15 unequal pendulums, all swung in unison. In this viewing, let us also consider a coded program translating the motions into MIDI tone musical notes. As we can see these pendulums sometimes align and sometimes fall out of sync from one another, digressing into more or less randomized chaos one moment, and then forming exquisite optical illusory patterns the next, we can also consider the notes attached to it as forming a melody created solely by classical physics. The most common and easiest to find, nowadays, example of the formation of a torus from a vapid substance in a less dense media are smoke rings, 
a form of vape trick performed by exhaling a breath of smoke through the lips held in a ring while clucking the tongue. The end result is a swirling circle of smoke in the form of a tube torus, a self-connecting vortex. Smoke rings have occasionally been sighted emitted from volcanic activity, while so-called lenticular or saucer-shaped clouds are known to form over tectonic fissures. Again, tribal peoples used smoke signals as a method of long-distance communication, and the hotboxing rituals of the Native American sweat lodges may have been an indication for the original use of the divine mastabas of the Giza necropolis as chambers of initiation. But rings of smoke in air are not the only example of the tube tours we may find now in the world around us. Dolphins, with their uniquely suited blowholes, have been recorded blowing playful bubble rings or air toroids that seemingly hover along in the water wherever the dolphin chooses to aim them, and at whatever speed. Fun and entirely harmless, the dolphins occasionally gulp down the bubble rings, only to blow the air back out again in another. Just as smoke rings can be used to, to study toroidal shapes using vaporous media, Bubble rings can be used to model the same physical properties in a completely fluid media. They obey the exact same laws of physics, those governing motions in any thermodynamic medium, and, as such, the toroid form should be considered native to the domain of thermodynamic media. The inarguably ultimate example of a smoke ring or vapor torus was the Soviet Tsar Bomba hydrogen test bomb dropped on October 30th, 1961. This weapon had a yield of 50 megatons, weighed 27 metric tons, and once dropped from an altitude of 10.5 kilometers above the Arctic Ocean, was designed to detonate at a height of 4.2 kilometers above sea level. The resultant mushroom cloud measured a base of 40 kilometers, a cap with peak width of 95 kilometers, and towered to a maximum height of 64 kilometers, seven times the height of Mount Everest, and above the altitude of Earth's stratosphere. The blast radius flattened the town of Severne, 55 kilometers away from ground zero, and the radiation from the blast caused third-degree burns as far away as 100 kilometers from ground zero. So, whether it is as simple smoke rings in a vaporous medium, as bubble rings in a fluid medium, or as the cap of a mushroom cloud explosion, what we are looking at in all these models is basically a tube torus, obeying the standard geometric rules for the topography of a tube torus, that being that a spiral maps onto its exterior surface. This spiral unfurls over time to form a vortex. A vortex occurs through the core of a torus. The measure of a vortex is that of a tube torus extended in the additional direction of time. A tube torus already being a model for a four-space hyperdimensional object, the idea of extending it into an additional direction to symbolize its changing topography over time may seem redundant, but the sinusoidal spiral pattern that doing so extrapolates from the tube torus accounts for its significance nonetheless. Thus, this vortex line is a spiral extracted from the involuting topology of a tube torus and extended over time. Given certain atmospheric conditions involving the rising and falling of hot and cold air along a storm front between a high and low pressure center, an average thunderstorm can quickly become a hurricane force gale and, particularly in large, wide-open spaces, can also form tornadoes. Such cyclones, or twisters, are, put simply, 
a vortex of high-speed wind capable of lifting objects, including people, and even whole buildings, and sending them flying through the air to land somewhere else as the serpentine whirling storm meanders and careens about until its impetus, the moist wind inside itself, subsides. Scientific storm chasers seek to predict, record, and study this phenomenon, which occurs most commonly in the American Midwest in so-called Tornado Alley. The same funneling vortex form can occur in a fluid medium as occasionally occurs in the winds of the air when certain given current and tidal conditions correspond such as an unplugged drain hole at the bottom of a basin full of water, or such as a particular kind of wake left behind a trolling motorboat. These both create a whirlpool, or underwater vortex. In a whirlpool, water rushes in a spiral from its surface height rapidly down a funnel vortex into a seemingly bottomless pit. The combination of the sinusoidal spiral vortex line model with a downward funneling cone-shaped medium forming a corkscrew pattern around the vortex should be beginning to become clear. While vortices comprised of air and of water exist in nature, leave it to humankind to invent an upward spiraling vortex made of flame using a circle of rotating fans a metal bucket full of gasoline, a kitchen match, and a camera. Shown here alternately at real-time speed and slowed down by a few hundred percent, the corkscrewing pattern of the upward spiraling vortex of flame is apparent, and results, obviously, from the effect of the fans creating a circle of wind around it. Because the fans all blow in clockwise rotation, from a perspective in front of one. The corkscrewing spiral undulating upward around the pillar of fire also takes on a relative clockwise pattern, as seen from underneath looking up. So we see from the natural examples for cyclonic vortices of air called tornadoes, of water spiraling down a drain forming a tiny whirlpool, a miniature replica of the same effect in a fluid medium of the compressed vortex as a flattened spiral, a weather pattern seen from space, and even in the contrail jet wash from airplane engines, which leaves behind it a disturbance to the air identical in form to the disturbance made to water by wake from the trolling motor of a boat. A vortex is the pattern formed by a toroid over time, and the flattened shape of the torus itself is a spiral. One spiraling vortex forms a conical funnel down from above and another upward from below, and these meet in the centroid core of the tube torus. Any force disturbing the inertia of a fluid medium will create a vortex in that medium. A wave front rolling up along the beach is merely an uncoiling vortex an unfurling torus. Likewise, the wind blowing through the thin air is only a wave as well, an undulating forward surge defined by its involuting undertow, its churning toroidal crest, and its elongated vortex wave front. The torus is also the shape predicted using computer modeling as underlying the orbital patterns of the stars in a spiral galaxy because, as stated, a spiral is a flattened version of the torus shape. The first perturbation of an unperturbed galaxy, comprised of a multitude of stars all arranged in concentric circular orbits, transforms it into a two-armed spiral galaxy shape, comprised of the same multitude of stars, only with their orbital patterns warped into a dual-twisted Mobius strip. Anywhere there is a spiral accretion disk surrounding the equator of a rotating central sphere, this spiral should be seen as a cross-section of a torus with the central sphere at its core. One vortex above the core and another below it expand outward conically 
to curve back around on each other in a vast arc, forming the shape of the tube torus. While the examples of naturally occurring vortices in terrestrial elemental conditions prove the spiral, torus, and vortex forms are, at least, native to this planet, the presence of the same patterns in the atmospheric weather on other planets, let alone of them underlying the entire volume of our galaxy as well, should indicate to us the universality of this pattern. Not only do spiral, toroidal, and vortex-shaped patterns arise in the currents of air and water on our own planet Earth, perhaps forming here only due to some unique trait of our dihydrogen monoxygen atmosphere, but they appear in the cloud formations of storms on Mars and Venus, and even the red spot of Jupiter is a foaming toroidal circumference. This pattern is proven universally ubiquitous by its example in spiral galaxies, and here the spiral, torus, and vortex patterns are currents in a medium of the universal element of gravity. So, if mankind can harness the vortex in the media of our own natural terrestrial elements, creating a spiraling tornado of fire using only a ring of fans, and, as in a commercial art fountain design called Charybdis, creating a similar vortex out of water, then how long will it be before humanity harnesses the pattern of the vortex to tame the universal elements? Fusion, fission, electromagnetism, and gravity. As we have already seen, the cap of the mushroom cloud of an atomic explosion mimics the pattern of an involuting torus. This effect occurs due to the atomic bomb's detonator device being triggered by an atomic implosion. The detonator device, when triggered, collapses inward on itself from all sides at once, and this sets off a nuclear chain reaction that, in turn, results in a massive explosion. If an implosive detonation causes a tube torus pattern, just as a ring array of fans can create a vortex of wind, then the question is not if we will ultimately use this type of technology to manipulate the natural forces of the cosmos further, but when. Already we see combinations of domes, spheres, toroids, and vortices being depicted in science fiction models as futuristic designs for tapping the cosmic forces more efficiently. So what further role might the patterns of the spiral, the tube torus, and the vortex coil have left to play in the experimental development of fusion, fission, electromagnetic, and even gravitational technologies? In his drafting and construction of Wardenclyffe Tower in Shoreham, Long Island, New York, from 1901, to 1917, Nikola Tesla took into account geometric patterns that, until the site of the Trinity test by the Manhattan Project in 1945, would not be seen again. His presciently mushroom-shaped antenna array remains the model for Echelon's satellite dish domes to this day, a spherical or toroidal top load in Tesla's model will broadcast any medium of energy in all or only in controlled directions respectively. The Nesta globe commissioned by Simon Tegela and built by James Designs shows a form of fluid dynamic perpetual motion machine using principles of design similar to a traditional hourglass an 800 millimeter diameter acrylic globe containing 250 liters of deionized water is connected to a second hidden tank in its pedestal with a nozzle between them that funnels the water draining back and forth into a vortex. This simple commercial art water fountain design may lead to further even more important designs in the future 
once humanity has learned to channel the elemental forces of the cosmos as we have the elemental forces of our planet. Until then, however, Tesla's schematics for copper wire coiled around toroidal magnets being used to broadcast wireless electricity, let alone the use of identical models capable of warping light speed by applying relativistic motors to focus gravity wells, remain only a pipe dream for quixotic backyard inventors and garage engineers. At present, the so-called vortex math movement is in the phase Thomas Edison was in when he once quipped, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. In the near future, however, particularly if partnered further with those interested in the Venus Project and creating self-sustaining, energy-efficient communities, the present experiments with electrical amplifiers using wires coiled in Rodin-Powell configurations can, in theory, yield a new age where the study of such patterns as circles, spirals, spheres, tube toroids, and vortices will become a branch of study in all fields of applied sciences, ultimately able to retool the automotive industry by redesigning the modern model for a car into a lenticular form, replacing the engine, the propulsion system, the wheels, and even the shape of the car's body itself with designs based on those geometric patterns. When a sphere is brought into interaction with a vortex, as with a ping-pong ball floating on the surface of water, caught into a whirlpool in the water, the sphere's reaction is to take on more or less regularized rotation around a bipolar axis. In other words, the presence of a vortex pattern in the media near a spherical mass can induce the mass to spin. This simple premise alone should be enough to inspire further applications and designs for motive machines making use of the spiral, the torus, and vortex patterns. Not only modern cyclotrons and antenna dishes should be being based on these geometric patterns, but the designs for other types of engines and machines should be as well. CERN's LHC, near Geneva, being a ring array of a long tunnel, mimics the shape of the torus using magnets to control the trajectories of lead ions. However, whatever is intended to be discovered by such a method has yet to be demonstrated. And so what plans for how to use whatever may one day be discovered using such methods remains an open-ended question as well. If humanity must prove itself worthy of free energy, and even anti-gravity technology, before attaining these goals, our great test will be nuclear disarmament. All that matters is if we will be willing to beat our swords into plowshares. By pulling a circular plate across the surface of a pool of water just so, we can create a wave front that will be visible as a pair of self-motivating, spiraling vortices at either end of it. These vortices are visible here because their spiraling the water's clear surface makes it act like a focusing lens. This model for creating a wave front, and consequently the pair of vortices that appear at either end of it, only requires a puddle, pool, or pond, and a plate, or a paddle, or oar. The twin vortices will continue on indefinitely, barring wind interference, depending on the dimensions and shape of the puddle, pond, or pool they are confined to, and the pattern of the wave front, including the nature of the vortices perpendicular to it at either end is alterable by changing the shape or dimensions of the paddle or plate. So what we are going to be looking at in the remainder of this section of this lecture video will be an experiment that can be replicated by anyone with access to a pool of water and a paddle or plate with which to stir it up. 
This should satisfy the Newtonian era conditioning that stipulates that what Einstein called a mental experiment must have a physically demonstrable component based upon a replicable experimental model. To make the models we will be showing in this section, all one would need would be a pool, a plate, and, if the water is clear enough, food coloring dyes. As stated, these vortices will, given a condition without the wind interfering with them, continue on their course, which is determined based on both the shape of the paddle or plate and that of the pool or puddle, for as long as they are able, because the wave front generated in this way will travel across the entirety of the undisturbed fluid medium. Such a wave front serves in itself as a model for perpetual motion, because the spirals, as long as provided with a supply of fluid, will otherwise continue on indefinitely. So, basically, with this model of a wave front dimpled by twin spiraling vortex whirlpools at either end, we are making a measurement of various types of pattern of disturbance to a thermodynamic medium caused by the interference of some object. And so we see this is not unlike the experiments demonstrating Huyen's synchronization wherein sound waves in a shared medium resulted in plesiochronous synchronization. We can think of the plate, or paddle, as being like the material objects in the Huyen's experiments, a pendulum clock, or a metronome. And we can think of the pool, or pond, as being like the medium of the shared surface, allowing all the local objects to fall into one group altogether. If we can use sound waves via a controlled medium to induce synchronization, then we can use waves in a fluid medium to model this. And by studying the wave fronts on water, we can learn more about how sound waves cause synchronization. The pair of vortices counter-rotate. This means one rotates around one direction and the other rotates the opposite direction. The one on the right of the wave front rotates clockwise, and the one on the left of the wave front rotates counterclockwise. Yet the twin vortices are, for the duration of their existence, directly relative to one another. The velocity of the whirlpool's spin, for example, is the same in both. The reason for the apparent parity of their spirals is that both whirlpools are opposite diameters of a single tube torus, broken in half by the surface of the water, forming an arc or handle manifold underwater, and causing the twin spiraling whirlpools to remain a single unified wave front, even along the portion of this current that is entirely submerged. In short, a toroidal pattern vortex of current forms underwater, connecting the spiral whirlpools so that they appear plesiochronous. Just as the whirlpools on the surface are spiral patterns, the current connecting them underwater is rotating in a corkscrew vortex, and both mimic the geometric behaviors of points on the surface of a tube torus 4 manifold. Although we cannot see this toroidal pattern vortex of current below the surface of the clear water with the naked eye naturally, we can ascertain that one whirlpool rotates clockwise, while the opposite, entangled whirlpool, rotates counterclockwise, because they are both opposite ends of the same tube, an underwater toroidal vortex of current. To make this current become visible to the naked eye, however, all we must do is add some food coloring, liquid dye, to the surface near the whirlpool spiral. As the dye is drawn inward by the whirlpool spiraling on the surface current, it is also drawn downward along an arcing vortex line created as the surface current funnels deeper underwater. If we apply colored dye to both whirlpools at either end of the wave front, we can observe the corkscrewing vortex that forms between them, as the colored dye from each slowly swirls around to connect to the other, forming one half of a tube torus. So, we have now seen natural and man-made spirals, 
toroids, and vortices comprised of terrestrial elements and implied the same effect may be induced in the cosmic elements as well. So, if we were using this method to model a pair of spiral galaxies, we could posit that such a vortex connecting them might form out of the cosmic element of gravity, or that a similar such vortex might connect the black hole at a spiral galaxy's core to the corresponding poles of each star in that galaxy, or even from each star to its planets and from each planet to its moons. Such a vortex line curving into a tube torus between twin spirals should be expected to be found most easily in cases where the spirals are clearly oriented relatively to one another and operant in opposite directions of motion, either clockwise or counterclockwise. However, the presence of an interconnecting pattern, such as a toroidal vortex, formed from the interference pattern arising between two signals, can occur even without these specific conditions. The proposition that a rotating spherical mass can, by its centripetal force, influence the medium surrounding it into a toroidal current is not debatable. Only the presence or absence of a so-called field of ether or zero-point energy as a medium for the transmission of this force can be questioned. As demonstrated using the medium of a whirlpool in water and a ping-pong ball floating more or less stationary on its surface, the reverse of this effect, wherein a vortex preceding the motion of a spherical body may cause a spherical mass to assume a condition of spin along multiple axes of motion, can also occur. So, if a wave front generated by a larger, older mass interferes with a non-spinning mass, the result is that it will generate spin. So, likewise, if it interferes with a spinning mass, the larger, older wave front amplifies or impedes the mass's spin. We can see this effect occurring gravitationally, with stars forming a flattened accretion disk around the equator of a rotating black hole, and of planets around the equator of a rotating star. The centripetal gravity of the larger, older mass attracts that of younger, smaller masses toward it. It does this by forming currents in an invisible medium. We call these currents gravity, but modern astrophysicists do not unanimously agree on the nature of the medium through which this force is apparently being transmitted. We can, thus far, only measure gravity indirectly by its effect on other objects. The only flaw in using the model of wave fronts and whirlpools in a pond or puddle generated using a plate or paddle to explain gravitational influences occurring between extremely remote and otherwise apparently unrelated massive objects in deep space is, again, because we cannot say for certain yet that the medium transmitting the force of gravity obeys the same principal laws of thermodynamics as a liquid medium such as terrestrial water. Although the fluid current may be indicative of a force, we cannot say with certainty that this force is exactly like that of gravity. It remains a possibility this current may indicate a cosmic counterpart current occurring between black holes and stars, between stars and planets, etc., but that this cosmic scale current is transmitting multiple forces, not only that of gravity. If we think of the whirlpools as symbolic of spiral galaxies, one rotating clockwise and the other counterclockwise, then there are certain implications from this thought experiment, but these can presently lead us only so far. However, if we think of the whirlpools as symbolic of separate events, apparently unrelated, and the direction of their spiraling currents being opposite one another, as being symbolic of the effect of Huyen's synchronization, wherein one or more objects in one of the events would assume the same or very similar rhythm to one or more comparable objects in the other event, then we can find additional levels of symbolic implication. For example, if the medium is thin air, and instead of a toroidal wave front in water, the transmitter of force is sound waves, 
then we may immediately find a similarity to Hoyen's synchronization. In the model of the clocks, or metronomes, for the synchronization effect, we would simply be looking at as many spiraling whirlpool sources as solid objects, and thus just as many currents overlapping and interfering with one another to average out into a single toroidal waveform pattern. In the model of underwater vortices, as in the model of synchronizing clocks or metronomes, any interruption, no matter how small, to the medium through which the waveform is being transmitted immediately terminates the parameters allowing the vortices to cohere or the synchronization effect to persist. If the toroidal waveform touches the wall of the pool, the vortex instantly retracts and dissipates. This remains the case whether the underwater vortex is interrupted by a solid mass, such as the wall of the pool, or by a current of force, such as a secondary vortex. If a younger, faster toroidal wavefront passes through an older, slower toroid inside this fluid medium context, it breaks the bond between the spiral whirlpools forming the toroidal underwater wavefront and causes both whirlpools and vortex to come to an abrupt end. So, if solid mass objects and currents of force can both break the symmetry pairing between the twin whirlpools in this model, what is the implication of this on comparing this model to Huyen's synchronization? Unlike living systems in the animal kingdom, which have free will as to when to fall into or out of a synchronized swarm, Models for non-living systems exhibiting synchronization depend on the nature of the medium transmitting a force between them. In the earlier experimental models for synchronization, this medium must be a closed system with a finite limit to itself, a definite border around it, etc. However, what we find in modeling a similar effect using a purely thermodynamic medium instead of a more solid shared surface is that the very boundaries defining the medium as a closed system tend to break apart the conditions necessary for modeling synchronization effect. Thus, when the medium is more solid, it requires it being a closed system, acting as its own independent frame of reference, apart from the influence on it of the ground and its gravity, etc. But when the medium is a purely thermodynamic medium, such as water or air, then any interferences, either solid or other waveforms, tend to disrupt the vortex model. In short, in a solid shared surface to exhibit synchronization, it appears necessary for it to be a closed system in a limited space, etc. But for a thermodynamic medium to exhibit a similar effect, it appears more efficient if in an open system with unlimited open area.